Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Jordan LaPierre. On the program this week, recapping the immigration angles in the first Democratic presidential debates. But before we get started, please remember you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you leave a review, it'll help more people find our show. You can also stream This Week in Immigration on our website at bipartisanpolicy.org slash podcasts. And as always, check out bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration on the brand new bipartisanpolicy.org for more information on the stories we discuss here on the show. And here with me today are the usual gang, Teresa Cardinal-Brown. She's Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy, and she's on Twitter at BPC underscore T Brown. Welcome back, Teresa. Hi, Jordan. And Chris Ramone, Senior Immigration Policy Analyst. You'll find him on Twitter at C Ramone BPC. Hi, Chris. Hey, Jordan. Hey, Jordan. How's it going? Good, thanks. So, by the way, Teresa and Chris were live tweeting both debates and had lots of great analysis and insights in real time. So if you don't already follow them, what are you waiting for? Go do that right now and then come back and join us for this conversation. That having been said, Teresa, I want to start with you. Uh, something that you tweeted before the Thursday debate, which is that immigration policy took the spotlight in these debates in a way that it typically doesn't. What's the significance of that for you? So f- I've been following sort of presidential debates for quite a while. Um, and, you know, I'm probably, you know, well, more years than I can count. Um, And this is the first time I think that immigration took such a central role in terms of the questioning, in terms of the level of detail, and in terms of, you know, being an important policy issue for the candidates to address. Um, Immigration is one of those issues that people always cared about, but to a lesser degree than other things, Uh, whether it's the economy or education or healthcare, all of those things sort of always took precedence. And immigration, if it was mentioned, was literally kind of in passing and uh, a generalized statement about whether immigration is good or bad was probably enough. This time, the candidates really were asked some detailed questions about how they would do things differently than what we're seeing now and um, were put on the spot uh, in terms of having good answers. Yeah, and I think for me, just thinking about this, is that I would say this is probably the first cycle in a long time where we're in the midst of a major extraordinary migration event um, with the Central American migration crisis. And obviously, this is going to be pushing this issue up um, a lot more than it would be, I think, in other years. If you take a look back at, say, um, the 2008 or the 2012 elections, there there wasn't really that much there. And obviously, it was 2015 with President Trump who kind of made that issue, um, you know, very salient to the to the campaign um, that he was able to make that an issue. Obviously, issues like the discussion about like the European refugee crisis during that campaign came up, but that was that was in Europe, you know. But right now, we're dealing with something that's directly affecting the United States, and I think that set the stage for uh, for a discussion and a robust discussion about that with these debates. Teresa, you also mentioned in a pre-debate briefing call we held that a lot of the candidates haven't staked out very detailed immigration positions yet. So how do you square the gap between the centrality of immigration in voters' minds and in these debates with the lack of detail on solutions thus far? Well, as Chris mentioned, uh, President Trump, when he announced his campaign in 2015, started out by making immigration a central theme of his campaign and has continued throughout his presidency. And clearly for Trump, he wants to run on immigration. He thinks that's a winning issue for him, for his base, and he is eager to fight that battle with Democrats on that issue. I think for many Democrats, however, um, they're not sure they want to engage Trump on his preferred playing field. So several of them strategically may have decided that immigration is an issue they want to lean in on. Um, They prefer to talk about other things like gun control or health care or any of these other issues. Um, but I think, as Chris said, the fact that we are currently in this situation right now with Central American migration, the president has continued to make it a key issue publicly discussing. It's going to be hard for these candidates to continue to ignore it. And that definitely came up in the debate. The questions were asked. They had to respond. And some responded with more detail than others. But I think you're going to see more of them having to lean in. Yeah, I I think in terms of the candidates so far, uh, Beto O'Rourke and Julian Castro have actually put out fairly comprehensive plans. I have my quibbles with both of them that they don't really address um, reforming the employment-based system. But aside from that, it's pretty well detailed. And, and sometimes I think that was reflected in these debates. But once again, uh, you know, the president just came out you know, a couple months ago with his proposal for a merit-based system. And it's going to be up to Democrats to be able to kind of look at this and say, how do we respond to this? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of candidates, but if, it's, if only two have really developed plans, uh, it's a question of whether or not they really want to engage on this right now. And that's that's where we need to see where it goes. 
So naturally, a lot of the questions focused on what the candidates would do on immigration with the power of the presidency, and several mentioned taking executive action. But as you both, both pointed out on numerous occasions during the two nights, Congress has a pretty central role to play here. Did you hear enough about how the candidates would work with Congress on reforms if they were elected? Yeah, this was a continual theme through both nights. What would you do on day one? And on day one, I would do this. And frankly, some of this was prompted by the way the moderators asked the questions. But in truth, what can be done by the executive branch on day one is limited to undoing executive actions of the previous administration. We saw that when President Trump came in and undid executive actions that Obama had. But real and lasting change in our immigration system is only going to happen if Congress gets involved. And what I didn't hear uh, really sufficiently from any candidate is how they would implement their policies via Congress. How would they get Congress to enact significant changes to immigration laws? Um, and I think that's really important for future moderators, for the public, for people who are examining these candidates' positions to lean in on. Because the fact of the matter is um, we are more likely than not continue going to continue to have a divided Congress in the future. And what that means is you're going to have to figure out a way uh, not just to expound your ideas, um, but actually implement them via Congress. Yeah. I, 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 this question was asked not necessarily in the context of immigration, but how would you work with Mitch McConnell? That came up multiple times in talking about bipartisanship. The problem with that question is it sort of assumes like Mitch McConnell is the only Republican in the Senate and the only Republican in the House of Representatives. That's not the case. You know, bipartisanship is you find different individuals who are interested in specific issues, form coalitions, negotiate, and try to come up with an agreement. And I think that sort of capacity to be able to play with different characters, um, different players in Congress, is really what's important. And so I think both questions um, that they were asked about, what would you do on day one with immigration, or how would you work with Mitch McConnell, the questions just don't get to the way that I think policymaking happens in Congress and the way policymaking on immigration happens, independent of whatever the president wants. The other thing that stood out to me was the laser focus on the situation at the border and about undocumented immigration. And there was little talk about the legal immigration system, which actually has a lot of bearing on the border crisis right now. Is this just representative of the cramped way we talk about immigration in America today, or is there more to how this broke down. So I've been saying this for, for a while watching, uh, you know, the campaign so far. My take on this is that, I'll be perfectly honest, I think the advocates um, on the left just simply don't care about this issue. I, I, I do think that they've been pushing on enforcement. They've been pushing on um, what's been happening with the border. Um, they've been pushing for protecting um, family-based immigration. Um, there's a whole host of things where they've been very active but they haven't been very active on you know, changing the employment-based system, as I noted earlier. And so I think that when the discussion comes up in this way, and that you see, you're seeing this in the debates as well, I think it is reflective of Democrats being obviously cognizant of their base, which you have to do. I mean, that's you know, how you run a primary. Um, but I think it's a, there's a major blind spot in that they're not really seeing the broader picture of other things that need to be changed. And it's ironic because if you think about what's happening at the border, that I think, honestly, we're now seeing mixed flows of individuals, including individuals who want to find work in the United States, uh, expanding the legal system so that way they can work in the United States, um, you know, through, say, for instance, the temporary visa program that we already have, expanding that would be one way of dealing with this, would actually be a way of helping to manage this crisis. It's not going to solve it, but it is one way of thinking about it. And I don't think Democrats are there um, for for the various reasons I just said. Yeah, I, I think that um, this, you know, when I first started working in immigration reform in the late 1990s, comprehensive immigration reform meant comprehensive in addressing every part of the immigration system. That included uh, how you secure the borders and how you conduct enforcement. It included what to do with the status of the undocumented, but it also included what reforms do we need to the legal immigration system. But I think in the past five or ten, five or so years, that middle piece, that legal immigration piece, fell out of the debate, really. The last time it was seriously addressed was in 2013 in the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill that passed in the Senate. But since then, uh, I think the debate has really just coalesced around the two pillars of enforcement and undocumented. Um, until President Trump started talking about merit-based immigration. And I think, as Chris said, we haven't really seen uh, immigration advocates broadly or Democrats um, 
really propose what they think our legal immigration system should look like. They they continue to oppose what the president has put forward, but other than protecting existing parts of the system, they haven't really put a counter vision forward. And I think that um, that is going to be important because the president's message of merit-based immigration is wildly popular. Uh, Americans really like that concept. They don't necessarily understand exactly what it means. And I think it can, the Democrats have an opportunity to define that in a way that's inclusive for their positioning, but they need to say something about it. Otherwise, I think uh, they end up, as, as Chris said, just in that opposition lane rather than really articulating a new and opposite vision. Chris, I want to turn to you here because it's not often that a small provision of the law, one that you've studied and written about, becomes a major flashpoint in a presidential debate. I'm talking about Section 1325 prosecutions. Julian Castro and Beto O'Rourke got into a pretty heated debate in the Wednesday edition on this topic, and I believe all the candidates except Senator Michael Bennett expressed support for ending these prosecutions during the Thursday debate. Can you explain what these prosecutions are and why the question is so central to the current border crisis? Right. So quick step back, a little bit of Immigration 101 for everybody. Immigration law largely consists of civil law. It's an administrative code of law. And violations of the INA tend to be you know, administrative violations. It's kind of like violating a driver's license, something related to driving, for instance, in, in, in any given state. The thing is that there's there's a handful of provisions in the INA of those violations that largely allow um, prosecutors to do uh, one additional thing on top of the administrative punishment that you'd get. So among these, one of them is what we call the 1325 violation, which is improper entry into the United States. That means you enter the United States without documentation and were detained. What this means in practice is that there's two options of what what can happen to you. One is that you can be put through removal proceedings and you will be put through removal proceedings because you violated the law and you're going to be you know removed through the United States um, either through removal process with an immigration judge or through expedited removal which is a quick way of doing it at the US-Mexico border. But on top of this there is the option that CBP can refer the individual to the DOJ for prosecutions under 1325, because 1325 has a criminal component that you can do jail time for violating it. Now, this is something that was ignored for a long time until 2005, when something that I wrote about called Operation Streamline came online, um, where you started seeing DHS referring more individuals to the DOJ for uh, 1325 violations, and that's now started becoming common practice. Now, when Julian Castro brought this issue up, he said, okay, well, let's get rid of those criminal prosecutions. I don't think he was saying, let's get rid of the administrative parts, which means that if you're removed from the United States, there are administrative penalties that you'll face. Um, and so that's what he was getting at. And I think one of the things that people are talking about this is it's a novel idea. It's not necessarily a novel idea because a lot of this kind of movement towards um, sort of either limiting or blunt to the effect of immigration enforcement um, penalties um, or trying to adjust them or rework them comes from earlier movements, uh, particularly what we call the Fixed 96 movement um, that emerged after um, IRA-IRA, which is a you know pretty stringent enforcement reform of the immigration law that came into effect in 1996. That whole movement kind of said, let's try to rethink interior enforcement and the penalties and try to kind of cut back a little bit on the, the, the extremities of the penalties that you saw in IRA IRA. So what Julian Castro is saying kind of is the spiritual successor to this movement. and It's not all that new, but I think the fact that it never really got public attention until now is the reason why people are kind of treating it as something novel. But in reality... This is something that we've seen for a while, at least among immigration advocates and researchers. Yeah, this was for me was a moment where immigration nerddom, if you will, <laughs> took precedent in, right. a, in a presidential debate to an extent I have never seen or heard before. Um, and so all of us immigration nerds uh, kind of went, oh, my God, he talked about 1325. Um, but there's another context here in which uh, it why it's there. And I think it's it has to do with the child separations of 2017, 2018. Um, because how that came about, if we go back and rewind the clock, is that President Trump's attorney general at the time, Jeff Sessions, announced something called zero tolerance. And what zero tolerance was, was that that, that DHS, Border Patrol, would refer to DOJ and DOJ would accept for prosecution 
everyone who entered the, the, the country without documents. Um, zero tolerance for illegal entry. And so what that meant was that everyone who came in, whether or not they came in with children as a family unit, would be sent to U.S. Marshals into the criminal justice system and separated from their child. Um, the impact of that was the child separation policy that everyone decried last year that caused President Trump to rescind that ratcheted back. So so for Castro, he saw that as the moment to revisit this movement and why. That when this criminal provision is implemented to the extreme, the consequence is this. And he did not agree with those consequences and therefore he's proposing eliminating that mechanism from law. And so I think that is the, it's first of all, again, immigration nerddom at its best to understand that linkage and make that connection. And then to see the rest of the field have to respond to that. That's what a provocative platform of immigration um, can do for a candidate. Uh, and I think that, again, that may trigger some of the other candidates to be a little more forward leaning and maybe some new ideas will come out and how they want to talk about this issue. The other thing I will say is, as Chris said, part of the way to of talking about this is, is problematic for a lot of people. I mean, immigration nerddom went nuts when he talked about that. But for most of the listening public who don't understand immigration law, it went way over their head. Uh, they heard him saying, we're not going to punish people for coming across the border. And that seems like open borders. Indeed, Lindsey Graham tweeted out almost immediately, this is what this means. President Trump is diving on it already. So I think if advocates want to go this direction, if Democrats really want to go this direction, they're going to have to find a way to explain it in a way that doesn't make it sound like they're for open borders, which is the easy charge to level at them. Yeah, I, I well I think the, the the use of the term decriminalize is just I understand where, where the advocates and the Democrats are coming out of this thinking about this in the broader context of criminal justice reform. We're going to decriminalize, for instance, marijuana penalties. I just don't think that's an inadequate term to be describing this because there still are the administrative penalties that you face because you're going to be removed through the United States. So Democrats are going to be really it's going to incumbent on them to, I think, come at it from a position of saying, no, you will be punished for violating immigration laws. And so far, I haven't really seen them kind of step out and say, yeah, people who violate the Immigration and Nationality Act should be punished, and this is how. But that's, that's what you're going to have to do. Yeah, it's not enough just to talk to the immigration nerds and the immigration advocates. They have to couch this policy in a way that's accessible to uh, the majority of Americans who aren't in that tiny slice of the pie. In the same vein, Teresa, you noted something interesting during the Wednesday night debate when Senator Cory Booker talked about immigration reform in the context of criminal justice reform. And you framed it in terms of punishment versus rehabilitation. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I think it was interesting to me with something we've been talking about internally here at BBC for a while. As Chris said, using the term decriminalize immigration can signal to a lot of Americans that you don't want to punish uh, and you don't want to have any consequences for violating immigration laws. And I think that's not what most of these candidates want. But what Booker did was frame it more in terms of um, we want to encourage compliance, but just engaging in harsh punishments as a way of trying to deter the behavior isn't necessarily successful. And that was the basis and fundamental of the criminal justice reform that he put forward, that we were over emphasizing harsh punishments, that it was causing us to over incarcerate people. And it wasn't actually reducing the behaviors that we were trying to get at, particularly when it came to, to drug, uh, drug crimes and drug usage. And so in context of immigration, I think I think what he was saying is, why can't we look at it in a similar way? I think he was trying to make the point that he had successfully engaged in bipartisan criminal justice reform, and so he is somebody who could engage on immigration in the same way. But I listened to it, and I heard that, hey, here's another way of looking at it. As I said just now, it's incumbent on Democrats to find a way to talk about this issue in a way that can attract an understanding of most of America. This may be the angle. Chris, there were some fireworks on Thursday when Senator Kamala Harris took former Vice President Joe Biden to task for the Obama administration's deportation strategy. What exactly was her criticism? 
She brought up uh, a program called Secure Communities. So Secure Communities is a program that emerged under the George W. Bush administration, but then subsequently was rapidly expanded by the Obama administration to help promote uh, interior enforcement of immigration laws. Uh, received a lot of criticisms from um, immigration advocates that stated that this deputized local and state law enforcement to become immigration um, enforcement agents and that this would have a negative impact on communities. Um, and this whole debate around secure communities actually sort of generated um, what I'm calling now the arms race of anti and pro sanctuary policies that um, you know states have done, localities have done, and even um, you know the Trump administration has engaged in. Um, and so for her, the way that she was thinking about this was that she was really apprehensive um, when she was working for the state of California to allow um, state and local law enforcement in the state to essentially enforce secure communities and kind of assist with immigration enforcement. Um, so that's the key issue. But I think stepping back more broadly, this is really an ongoing debate about the extent to which state and local uh, law enforcement should be working with immigration authorities. Uh, but this was kind of the, the first initial salvo. So taking a look at, you know, Immigration History 101. Um, we're in college for this pot, for this podcast session. But, you know, um, that that's kind of where this whole um, sanctuary movement came from, uh, that this notion that, you know, states and localities started feeling very uncomfortable with this position. Uh, you know, so so that's where this is coming from. This is where, you know, I think a lot of the Democrats have also been on thinking about interior enforcement um, in the Trump era, that they really have not been happy with uh, the level of uh, the way that the, the Trump administration has been pushing for greater cooperation between state and local law enforcement. But I think, you know, it's, it's it really touches into a broad history uh, on this issue. So so I, I do think it's important to note that secure communities um, actually started under the George W. Bush administration and was inherited by the Obama administration. And um, and and but it was expanded under the Obama administration and was one of the reasons why Obama was able to uh, become the deporter in chief, and in during his you know tenure in office, deport over a million people. Um, it it was set up to identify immigrants who had come in contact with law enforcement uh, to identify and supposedly prioritize those with criminal convictions for removal. It was an easy, facilitated way for ICE to identify people for removal rather than going out into neighborhoods and trying to find people that they didn't know where they were. Um, it, Chris is right. I think it did generate the the sanctuary movement that we see today. But point in fact, what Kamala Harris was doing was making Biden defend that Obama legacy of deportations in an era when, at least for Democrats, that's no longer acceptable. Chris, you also highlighted that Biden touted the investments the Obama administration made in Central America as helping to stem the flow of unaccompanied children back in 2014. But you noted on Twitter that it's hard to draw such a direct line between those funds and, and any change that happened in migrant flows. Why is that? So, you know, I've spoken with um, officials from the State Department that explained to me sort of the deployment of this assistance to uh, the Northern Triangle, to these countries that Congress has appropriated. It takes about three years to, find, to go from Congress signing the bill, uh, or passing the bill, sending it to the president, to the moment that the USAID um, implementers on the ground are using these funds to be able to carry out their, their projects. Um, and so knowing that and when this particular uh, uh, appropriations was passed, um, a lot of that funding really won't be hitting these countries until 2018, 2019. Uh, and that's provided that there are funds that President Trump has not cut um, you know, as part of his threats to these countries to you know, be able to clamp down on immigration. Um, so basically, it's it's kind of saying, yeah, I'm trying to take credit for it, but that really wasn't the case. If anything, if you look at the deportation numbers of individuals that the Mexican government carried out, the numbers were pretty significant. In fact, I think they hit their, their, their peaks in deportations of individuals in 2015. And you also saw a peak in the number of individuals that were being removed through Mexico's Central America return program where they return individuals um, back to the country um, through a coordinated process. So I think, if anything, it was Mexico sort of stepping up on enforcement that kind of helped, you know, sort of stabilize that crisis. But when it comes to funding, we're really not seeing anything that's happening until now. Now, to, to be fair, 
uh, you know, and the conversations that I've had, um, you know, a lot of the progress progress that's been made in El Salvador has been made because of this funding that there was there's you know especially with the violence prevention programs the gang prevention programs that there sort of has been an impact on the ground but that really started happening in 2018 and this year but once again the president um you know has cut that funding and so it's a question of whether or not this impact will continue but that's i think the important context and the only additional thing I would make is understanding just the timeline for deployment of funds and then how long it takes to see impacts from those funds. It is absolutely essential that if we want to deal with migration from Central America, we deal with the root causes in Central America. But we also have to understand that this is not a quick fix. This is an investment. And we need to continue that investment. If we stop and start the investment, the gains that may have been made can very quickly regress. And so we do need to figure out exactly what are the best investments and how we keep them going. Um, but it's not going to be a valve that will turn off migration in the year, the same year we pass money. Uh, it's not an absolute solution. And I think a lot of the Democrats leaned into that as this is how we should address migration. It's not sufficient. It's necessary, absolutely necessary, especially in the long run. But it's not sufficient to address what's happening right now. I, I think, you know, you've heard the phrase Marshall Plan for Central America that's fine. That's 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 certainly ambitious. But the, the fact of the matter is that there's so many different dimensions to an extraordinary migration crisis like this one. That there's the sending conditions, the the, the push factors in these countries, the enabling factors like the smugglers, um, and then obviously, uh, you know, the immigration system here in the United States in a lot of ways that it's just been inadequate to to manage this whole process and this entire crisis. Um, you need a multifaceted approach. Um, I think you know talking about you know once again talking about push factors kind of tends to me I think lean a little bit more towards the immigration base, uh, sorry the the democratic base on this issue because unfortunately um, you're going to need some enforcement, you're going to need some security cooperation, and you're going to need to have people removed from the United States. And just focusing on push factors kind of allows them to a little skate by those very difficult conversations. So stepping back from the specifics, what else surprised you both about these debates and the role of immigration policy in them? Teresa, I'll start with you. Um, again, I think going back to what we said at the beginning, just how much immigration was talked about uh, during these debates. Um, you know, it's I, I had a lot to tweet about in two nights, <laughs> um, more so than I than I thought I would over a range of issues. Um, and I think that that's relevant. But I think, you know, one of the things that I think as we talked about still needs to um, be explained by many of these candidates is the details and how they would implement it. Um, the other surprising thing, as I said, is the, 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 if you will, the detailed nature of what was talked about. Um, some candidates clearly had a much more comprehensive and nuanced and detailed understanding of our immigration system and how it works and others didn't. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that eventually um, somebody who wants to have the office of president of the, of the United States has to understand enough of how our immigration system works to have more than overly simplistic responses. I think we have seen with the current administration um, sort of a, a, if you will, a, a, a a dichotomous set of positions. I think that President Trump is not somebody who has a detailed understanding of the immigration system, and that's one reason why a lot of the policies that he's put forward have not been operationally successful. On the other hand, he has several people in his administration who do have a detailed understanding, and when they have implemented that detailed understanding, have been able to push buttons, particularly on the regulatory side, to influence the system. And so understanding and seeing how those two things interact in this current administration makes me want to look at these Democratic candidates and say, okay, if you have a level of understanding and detail, how are you going to use that? And if you don't, who else are you going to bring into your administration that would, and how are you going to use that? So again, I think we're not going to see the end of this immigration conversation. Um, we're at the beginning, but um, it's, it's definitely on the table right now. The question on the second night where they asked the candidates, um, would you provide undocumented immigrants with access to health care and uh you know in a, in a national health care system i think the fact that they all raised their hands was shocking and i'll be perfectly honest not particularly politically smart now why is that politically smart well we did some you know polling last year um that found that 
Americans, when it, what their concerns about immigrations and immigrants was, it was not competition for jobs or drop of wages or, or anything along those lines that we've you know been he- been hearing that indiv- you know individuals when they're concerned about immigrants they're, they're concerned about their jobs their wages. It was actually competition for benefits, and we didn't probe and see you know whether or not they understood that. In fact, um, especially undocumented immigrants do not have access to a lot of benefits. We didn't probe that, but it was still a finding that really was thought provoking because here we are thinking. We thought that Americans were concerned about competition for jobs and, and, and wages, but that wasn't it. So taking that and then seeing that response makes me think this wasn't very smart at all, if that's where public sentiment is. I think that you know Democrats, had they not raised their hands, they could have said something along the lines of, you know, I believe in giving these individuals who've been here for 10 years, has a, they have a clean criminal record, and they pay a fine – that they can, you know, get a provisional status to get a green card, um, and say that then those individuals' provisional status can get access to to healthcare. That would be a way that I would have responded to that. Thinking about balancing sort of, you know, the base of for the Democrats, who obviously I think a lot of them would want them to be able to extend healthcare to uh, undocumented immigrants, but also trying to be realistic and and give a sense to I think a majority of the public that is uncomfortable with that and that they want to see people you know, who have been here and, and, and deserve to be here, maybe have a chance to access this, but they have to kind of get right with the law, and they don't think that this was the way of doing it. The one thing to know is that there is a body of literature, though, that does suggest that, you know, extending undoc- um, health care to undocumented immigrants would actually lower health care costs because they wouldn't be using um, emergency health services that are expensive for counties and, and local governments. Um, it's a theoretical body that exists, and nobody's really gone in there and tried to like really prove it because there really isn't any cases of that so far. Um, so there, there is a policy case that you can make an argument for that, but I think it's all about the framing. And the framing really is, I think for a lot of majority of Americans are more worried about getting health care for themselves and for their fellows, uh, you know, who are also citizens then, to be honest, than, than immigrants. And I think that the way the question was phrased, the way the responses were, were, were crafted, um, I don't think gave that indication to it. So there is a way I think you can thread that needle. I didn't see that yesterday. All right, let's close with this. You each have the power to give one question to the moderators of the next Democratic debate next month. Um, what would that question be? Chris, I'll start with you. So I think the question that I would ask, and, and, and you're going to see some parallels with the way I'm thinking about this with Teresa, but we, we're getting at two different things. My question is, yesterday, uh, so that was the second debate, um, there was a question that was asked, you know, would you deport, what, what would you do with somebody who's in the country um, without documentation or without legally? Would you deport them or what would you do? Um, I actually think the question should have been, uh, you have two people. One's been here in the United States for 10 years without documentation. That's it. And the other person's been here for two weeks without documentation. What would you do with both of them? And I think the reason I ask this question is that it's a tougher question to ask because on one hand, you could say, in, in the case of the first individual, yeah, you know what? Let's not deport them. They're part of the community. I'm sure they're working. They're contributing in some way. You know, th- that's a way of thinking, yeah, you know what? Like, I think... Let's let's provide this person with the capacity to stay here and maybe give them access to to legal status. And I think a lot of Americans would be in support of that. But the recent entry, I think, gets more to the question of, are you going to deal with uh, violations of the Immigration and Nationality Act of Immigration Law, and how are you going to enforce it? Um, are you going to be a little bit tougher with people who just got here than people who've been here for a long time? So it kind of gets to this question that of, of proportionality of the types of punishments that you met out for violating the immigration law. And Teresa was talking a little bit about this earlier. So it gets back to the idea that um, not all immigrants who are undocumented are the same. Uh, you know, they're coming in with different statuses of how long they've been here, and I think it's important to differentiate that. And that's, a, I think, a tougher question to ask, but it's an important one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, just following into what Chris said, um, you know, President Trump has accused Democrats of being open borders. You know, in, in the Trumpian way of throwing a nickname out and having it stick, that one is sticking, Um, in a lot of ways for a lot of voters. And I think it's incumbent upon Democrats to explain how they are not for open borders. And that means 
difficult conversations about enforcement, which for the most part, Democrats have not been willing to engage in other than, you know, um, railing against the way the president, this president has engaged in enforcement. It's a challenging question for Democrats in part because they want to see legalization for most of the undocumented in the United States, the 11 point million. That was the answer to the question that was asked last night or on Thursday night. They do want to see legalization. In fact, that's a position supported by 80 percent of the public. So it's not an unpopular position to say you want legalization. But what Chris's question gets at, and, and I agree, is you still need a plan for how you enforce against the next person that comes across. The way I like to think of it and the way I would frame the question is, if we legalized everybody tomorrow, how would you enforce the law against the next person who committed a violation? What would the system look like for them? That sort of takes it out of the legalization versus enforcement debate, which I don't think most of the public supports. It's not either or, it's both. And forces them to think about how they would conduct it differently. Because when you are in the executive branch, you are required to enforce the law as written um, as best you can within the resources given to you. And there is discretion, but you're still required to do that. So what would that look like? How would you do that? Teresa, Chris, thanks so much for being here. And thanks to you all for listening. We'll be back, as always, in two weeks. In the meantime, please take a second to find us on Facebook by searching Bipartisan Policy Center or on Twitter at BPC underscore Bipartisan. And don't forget to subscribe and leave your feedback on this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Bipartisan Policy Center. This episode of This Week in Immigration was written by yours truly and produced by Yafet Tawahare. That's all for now. Join us next time on This Week in Immigration. Mm-hmm.